Hey, uh, Chris, I got something for you here, buddy. What's up? What's up? Boom. Oh, there it is. Hell yeah. Galliano. You know, Barbara said you texted her. What was it you said? <laughs> Prodotto de Livorno. Uh, cazzo. Anyway, this shit is delicious. What the fuck is that? What does it even taste like? What does it taste like? Uh, well, it's got a few tastes. Kind of like a vanilla, sort of anise, sort of lemony, sort of, uh, uh, liqueur. It's 40- How boozy is it? It's like not, it's not like a full strength. 42%. It, it is 42%? God damn. It wow. It is 42%. Wow. But this is where I live. This is where right. I, I was, <laughs> I was born to, uh, drink these sorts of Gilded Age, Spirits of Elderflower, <laughs> Italian mm-hmm. liqueurs. Yeah. I mean, something that, I mean, some real rot gut. I mean, the, the kind of floral, uh, you know, uh, good shit. I'm going to be mm. drinking this for the entirety of the episode, so hoping I can go earlier uh, after uh, Shane on there, everybody. <laughs> but um, this, is, uh, it's, this is what I like. This is what I like. I imagine drinking this after, you know, coming back from World War I. I'm extremely shell shocked. I had to lay a sibling to rest or something mm. like that. I mean, some real, you know, some real sick shit. But you know, at least you had a nice uh, uh, Italian digestif to have after dinner before you, you know, fall asleep for five days because you ate off of a lead plate. I was born Cheers. to drink diet Shasta or whatever <laughs> else they had at the corner <laughs> grocery, and and just 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 paint thinner mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> Until I ruin the what's left of my intestines. Oh, it burned. The first one burns going down. Does it burn? It's not even smooth after no, all that? No, it's very smooth. I'm just, it's, I got the gird, <laughs> man. I got the gird. Ah, uh, fucking Tracy, bring me over some fucking roll age. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's right. It's just the first one that hurts quite a bit, and then the rest of it. I'm told by several doctors that I've talked to online that that's fine. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about it too much. See, this is what I like about, you know, we're living at home, we have no lifestyle, we get, you know, probably one-tenth of the sun exposure that our grandparents did. Um, mm-hmm. This is this mm-hmm. is important for us to be able to kind of live the healthy lifestyle. Every generation gets better than the next. That's the point of America. That's why we're here. That's why we're celebrating President's Day. Oh, buddy. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta be honest, before you even suggested that as a topic, I forgot that was even a thing. I had no idea. <laughs> like, I, I had no idea. I, 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 had to put, I had to put two and two together when at first you suggested a President's episode. I was like, why? This is, this oh, is yeah. the, the sacred time of year that we yeah. all go to PC Richards and shine and <laughs> get, a, get a half off on a hay uh, fridge. I wanted to get one for my bush light to put in my garage. That's funny. What, what I was going to mention, we Drinking were talking about... Drinking next to an oil stain. We, we, we had mentioned Andrew Jackson prior to the... before the show started, and it just got me thinking about... Um, you remember Trump's weird, um, like, infatuation with Andrew Jackson? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Especially yeah, when he, yeah, when he yeah. first started, and how, how... What a funny, like, dumb guy with, like, sort of any historical perspective um, <laughs> president to choose. And he was like, he was very tough, very smart, Mm-hmm. He at one point said that um, he said if the he said if if, if uh, Jackson was the president during the Civil War it never would have happened. Jackson <laughs> saw the Civil War coming. He was disgusted by it. He was disgusted by the Civil War. Jackson was dead like two decades before the Civil <laughs> yeah, War started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it scans because Jackson was really the first like frontier soldier kind sure. of president like everybody before that had come from the sort of upper crust mainly exactly. from the virginia exactly. landowning Fucking class or the new england you know that that class jackson was the first like man of the people guy. and it's really funny that that's how that that's what trump somehow identifies with <laughs> yeah <laughs> well he was uh, brutal and stupid yeah. and made, yeah. Pri- yeah. known primarily for his massacres right and racism <laughs> and un- unashamed yeah. racism yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it all scans, yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he was misunderstood. He was misunderstood in his mm-hmm. time. He wasn't appreciated. <laughs> he's got, like, at Mar-a-Lago, he's got, like, a portrait of it set up next to his waiting pool. Mm-hmm. And at night, he just goes in there and looks at him. <laughs> Jackson, I wish you were here. If I had they, ten men like you. <laughs> they called him Stonewall Jackson. He was the same person. <laughs> The same man. He was a, a Civil War general, and then and then he became president. He was a wonderful man. <laughs> fucking idiot. He is the fucking landed gentry fop that that uh, you know the original. Oh, uh, Jackson would have hated him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he would have slaughtered yeah. him on sight. 
Now when I was a young boy About the age of five My teachers taught me I could be the greatest man alive They told me I could change the world Be whatever I wanted to be There was no one in the world like me Every one of us was so unique I'd not be an average man Welcome back, everyone, to Eat the Rich. This is a show about our political economy, late-stage capitalism, and the millionaires, billionaires, and multinational corporations hell-bent on staving off his death rattle. I'm Dwight, and today we have with us Shane. Howdy. And we've got Chris. Uh, hello. Hey, guys. Uh, happy President's Day. Happy President's Day, my friend. <laughs> happy President's Day, everyone. Yeah. I mean, I hope all of our email boxes are flooded with offers from brands and mm-hmm. the different discounts that they provide us. Um, it's for me, at least, I I think, uh, Shane, you were echoing this earlier. I, uh, completely forgot that this was even here, that I had a long weekend, uh, just had no idea. Not that I would fucking go anywhere or do anything anyway, because we're just under threat of, you know, viral attack. But this was an opportunity, I thought, to kind of like sit back. One of my, like my favorite genre of like the Eat the Rich episodes that we do is like where we come together with our, you know, individual, go off into our corners and come together to present to each other. Just some fucking oddball, insane shit uh, with potluck. a particular... <laughs> it's an eat the rich potluck. <laughs> President's Day potluck. And, and so that's, that's... Oh, that's the episode title, clearly. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so for us to kind of come together and uh, talk about some presidential uh, points of interest. And uh, let's, let's, no further ado, let me take, uh, put it over to you, Shano. What do we got? Sure. Um, so uh, I guess we're going to move through this chronologically. Um, and I think the, the little uh, episode that I want to talk about um, comes the earliest. And for this President's Day episode, uh, the story I wanted to talk about is the brutal annexation of Florida. Uh, by the United States, which uh, Mm -hmm. took place over many decades, but culminated in 1819. Um, It actually stretches across two presidential administrations, that of Madison and Monroe. But a key player in this is a third guy who we happen to be talking about just at the front of the show, which is our friend uh, Andrew Mm -hmm. Jackson. Oh, yeah. Um, and so Friend of the show. Friend of the um, show. I'm going to be covering like a lot of history. And so I'm going to do my best to try and balance it with like detail and also, um, you know, brevity. But to just sort of set the stage um, in the early 1800s, uh, Florida had been mostly a Spanish colony for about three centuries. St. Augustine was one of their big early settlements that was founded in 1565 as the sort of like capital of the other settlements that they had there. It was still under the umbrella of their colony in Cuba. Um, Yeah, oldest uh, European settled city in the country, right? I believe. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, They briefly lost control of it and after the Seven Years' War, when governance of Florida was handed over to the British, that was in 1763, then it was given back to the Spanish at the end of the American Revolutionary War in 1783. So there's this little 20-year interim in Spanish rule, um, and during that time, the territory was divided into two parts. West Florida, which is basically the modern panhandle, but it continued along the coast up to the Mississippi River. So what is now basically the southern coastal areas of the state of Mississippi and Alabama. And then there was East Florida, which is like the peninsula itself. And so, of course, this is just like talking about the machinations of like the European colonial powers. Um, uh, And in that sense, you know, both those areas were relatively lightly settled by European whites uh, around a few key trading outposts that were mostly centered in the western half. So cities like Biloxi, Mobile, Pensacola. And then on the eastern half, um, it was sort of all around that area that I mentioned, uh, St. Augustine. And, you know, prior to the Europeans showing up, there had been Many different indigenous peoples who'd lived in the areas for thousands of years, but the majority of them had died by the late 1700s from disease and war brought to them by the Spanish and British. And in the series of wars and displacement that occurred before and during the American Revolution, there was an influx into the area of a number of different native tribes fleeing encroaching raids by white settlers to the north. 
and in particular was the Muscogee and Choctaw peoples, um, which the Americans often just called the Creeks as, as a general like you know combination. And at the same time, free slaves who had escaped plantations from you know the southern states and particularly the Carolinas also came into this area of the Florida Territory. And all of those peoples kind of mixed together, and they formed this new hybrid culture that was then called the Seminoles. Um, and so by the early 1800s, there were approximately four to 6,000 Seminoles living in the Florida Territory. So at the end of the Revolutionary War, the story we usually hear is like, okay, you know, we fought the war against the British, then there was peace, there's a new nation, and we're sort of preoccupied not with, you know, external conflict, but with like figuring out how to run the nation. But in practice, right, like the violence of the, the Revolutionary War just kind of continued, except it was pushed to the, you know, the boundaries of that territory. Right. Um, with the you know the violence of colonial expansion, it got pushed westward and southward against native peoples all along what were essentially these very like murky borders drawn up by the different European powers. And in Florida, this was particularly the case because there weren't particularly clear boundaries dividing any of these spaces that I was talking about between West and East Florida. Um, you know where exactly that northern line was then with the new American Republic, but also. This was further complicated during the so-called Louisiana Purchase in 1803, mm. which we all remember from high school American history class. Mm -hmm. And the main kind of question of contention at that time was, was West Florida legally part of this purchase or not? And, you know, the clear answer is like, no, to the extent that the purchase was legal at all. Again, this was just like this big, you know, land swap grab that, you know, between European powers that had nothing to do with like recognizing any of the indigenous rights to any of that territory um, or the people living there. But even according to the dictates of the treaty, no, West Florida was not a part of the Louisiana Purchase. So why was there confusion about like this boundary? Um, because a bunch of American politicians just made it up. They just started what? saying that, like, West Florida was a part of the, per the this, you know, this land grant, um, and it should be. And this was mainly Jesus the Jeffersonian Christ. kind of faction. And they just started kind of saying, yeah, West Florida is now our territory, too. And so because of this encouragement, between 1803 and 1810, there was an influx of white American settlers, who were mainly traders, um, and like uh, landowners, you know, kind of plantation guys, and general no good bastard frontier type <laughs> guys, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, who just start kind of moving into this territory, laying claim Ruffians. to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, uh, in West Florida, and so again, this is like that coastal panhandle area. Um, in the summer of 1810, these American settlers start getting together and forming their own local government structures that are pro-american and they start rattling on about liberty um they're calling themselves patriots and when in fact they're just like foreign invaders like <laughs> moving into this territory and claiming the land and so they they start making all these like fancy proclamations and they start storming the local armories the spanish administrative buildings they start killing governors and other like spanish officials and you know like kind of moving towards independence um and so then later, after, the, the, after all this is happening during that summer, in the fall of 1810, so October 27th, President Madison simply just declares that the territory is now part of the United States. He just, he just makes a proclamation, and he just says, Love it. yeah, West Florida has always been naturally part of what America's boundary should be, mm -hmm. and so now it's ours. Um, Last time, last time, by the way, we would we would ever pull that move. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, there is a historian, this guy named Walter Nugent, who I believe is a conservative, but he's nonetheless critical of America's expansionist history. And he has his book about this, which I read a long time ago. And it's about the not just this episode, but the various waves of bloody annexations. Um, and the book is called Habits of Empire. And he really succinctly summarizes the Madison administration's strategy here. So I want to read it. Quote, inspire a local uprising. Do not commit the United States officially or publicly. Rely on local governors, militias, and private citizens rather than U.S. regulars as far as possible. When the uprising succeeds, recognize them as the local authority, and then annex the supplicant territory to the United States. 
So that's what they did. <laughs> and I'm not going to get super into the details of all the little skirmishes and things that happened because I want to move on to the later parts. But again, this was pretty bloody stuff. You know, they would, it wasn't yeah. like they would just declare themselves independent. They'd go in and they'd kill people. Um, they, you know, shoot the local governor, tar and feather him or whatever, and call him an agent of tyranny. <laughs> you know, just like totally <laughs> insane. Um, and I think it's interesting to talk about it because, you know, this period is not really as studied or talked about, certainly not in the American history classes and stuff I had, um, as much as like the much larger annexations of land that came on later, right, that are traditionally then categorized as like a westward expansion or manifest destiny, right? Um, but, Chris, as you were saying, this is the beginning of a template that the United mm -hmm. States would use mm -hmm. throughout its history up until this day. And it's also worth noting that at this point, many of these local self-declared -de patriot groups justified this illegal seizure of power because of a perceived anarchy or lack of law and order, which was really just a thinly veiled racist code about the Spanish authorities not, quote, dealing with the Seminoles, who I had talked about, right? Nice. Um, and so the Patriot groups were made up, again, like I said, of like wealthy traders and plantation owners. And typically, when these guys would move into the Floridian territory, they would bring their estates with them. And that meant they would bring their slaves, right? They would try to set up new plantations and stuff. And so for them, like a large presence of freed slaves right next door was considered to be unlawful, right? That's why we need to bring in law and order. Jesus. So after the annexation of West Florida, the, the same pattern was tried in East Florida. But it wasn't as easygoing, and it led to a protracted series of skirmishes called the Patriot War of 1812. And it was called this in part because, again, the militias fighting it considered themselves patriots. But also, at this point, this was during the War of 1812 that the U.S. had with Britain, right? Right. And at the time, Britain was allied to the Spanish. And so the justification that these just, like, mobs had as they went into Florida is that since the Spanish are allied to the British, they're basically British. So we can just fight them. Even though, again, it was, like, you know, internationally illegal to the extent that any of those, like, <laughs> statutes meant anything. They were just moving in and starting up shit. Um, and when they went to do that in East Florida, it didn't go as well as in West Florida. And they basically had their asses handed to them by, by the Spanish <laughs> and the British. Um, and, uh, and it seemed like th that wasn't going to work a second time. That is until a certain figure arrives on the scene. And here we are back again at Andrew Jackson. And so he ended up getting involved here uh, as a course of a separate conflict going on that in U.S. history is called the Creek War of 1813-1815. Um, and I don't want to get too far off track, but the gist of it is that the Muscogee people had become divided over the question of coexistence with the ever encroaching and hostile white American settlers, right? So like so certain factions were like, we should try to live in peace and others were like, no, they've made it very clear that peace is impossible. And so this had split, you know, the Creeks into a variety of different factions and the, the ones that were fighting the Americans ended up getting aided by the Spanish and British. Um, and then the ones that were sort of pro-peace ended up fighting on the American side. And um, the American side was one of the major leaders uh, during this was Andrew Jackson. And I want to read again from this uh, Nugent book on this because it gives a, a nice summary of to get a tenor of what was going on. So, quote, on October 12th, Jackson, a major general of the Tennessee militia, led 3,500 volunteers into northern Alabama. Pouncing on one creek village or party after another, by the close of winter, they had killed more than 700 Indians while losing Jesus. 200 Georgia militiamen and fewer than 50 Tennesseans. On March 14th, Jackson's army, by then 4,000 strong, arrived opposite the elaborate creek fort at Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapoosa and faced more than 1,200 creeks. The decisive face-off took place on March 27th. The Americans lost 47, along with 23 che creek and Cherokee allies. While the Creeks suffered, by American estimate, 900 killed and 300 taken captive. This broke the Creeks. Since October, probably 2,500, more than half of their effectives, had been killed or put out of action, while another 1,000 retreated into East Florida. They were through as a fighting force, and nearly through as a nation. No longer could the Spanish count on them. Britain, about to land thousands of guns at Apalachicola for the Creeks, was abruptly deprived of them as allies. Jackson's demolition therefore not only affected the Creeks, it also dented British objectives to recapture the Gulf Coast and New Orleans, 
and laid Pensacola and East Florida open to him if he chose to ignore international boundaries and compound Wilkinson's act of war at Mobile. He so chose. First, he dealt with the Creeks. Determined to end their independence permanently, he met with their leaders at the newly built Fort Jackson on the Alabama just north of present Birmingham on August 1, 1814. A week later, under pressure, they signed a treaty requiring them to give up 23 million acres, about two-thirds of present Alabama and a third of Georgia. It was the bulk of their land. The signers represented about 8,200 Creeks who were not Jackson's red stick enemies. What was left of them had escaped to Florida, but his allies. As his biographer observed, quote, Jackson converted the Creek Civil War into an enormous land grab. It was the beginning of the end not only for the Creek Nation, but for all Indians throughout the South and Southwest. In Jackson's mind, there was no other way. Sixteen years later, as president, he would sign the Indian Removal Act, which took the dispossessed Creeks well beyond the Mississippi. Um, so I wanted to read that, you know, just to give some color, as I'm sure we all know already, about Jackson's character and what he would do um, later on. But the idea here is, you know, they fought a number of battles sort of north of Florida. Um, a number of uh, the, the Creeks had retreated into Florida, and a number of them rallied around uh, Pensacola, uh, and they met up here with the some Seminoles, who were their allies, and they were trying to link up with the British and Spanish, so American forces strike against the British and Spanish forces in the area of West Florida. And Jackson eventually pulls out of this area altogether to go slaughter a British army up at New Orleans, which, when he does so, this ironically occurs two weeks after the peace treaty between the U.S. and the British was signed, ending the War of 1812. But, uh, you know, back then, obviously, it took a while for messaging to get around. People were on the move. But, you know, given everything that we know about Andrew Jackson, it's, I think it's fair to say, if he, even if he knew that the peace treaty had already been signed, he probably would have gone to fight there anyway to, yes. to, to, to kill them. Um, and so, again, even though this was sort of, you know, an illegal act that took place after the war, Jackson was hailed as a hero. And in 1815, <laughs> he was given an auspice, which I'd never heard of until I was re researching this, called the Thanks of Congress. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, one of those. And, and in addition to that, they didn't feel that their thanks was sufficient. So then they also gave him a congressional gold medal <laughs> for, for being a, a slaughterer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, after that, the British-American War was formally wrapped up. But nonetheless, Jackson again led an army into eastern Florida, sparking what is called the First Seminole War, which occurred between 1816 to 1819. Now, since this is running long, I'll just say... You can imagine the overall strategy here is the same kind of bloody displacement and massacres that we can imagine that were just described. Um, but I do want to give a little detail about the beginning of this incursion, which involves uh, a really in <laughs> improperly called battle. It's not a battle. It's a massacre um, at a place called Prospect Bluff or alternatively Negro Fort. And that should probably hmm. give you a sense of where this is going. Interesting. And so... This fort uh, was located in what is now the Florida Panhandle along the Apalachicola River. Uh, it had been built by the British in 1814 in the midst of their war with the Americans, and during that time, they had invited Creeks, Seminoles, and freed slaves, and basically anyone who was fleeing the United States, to come settle there. And so at one point, there were several thousand such people gathered there under ostensible British protection, but also as like a potential army to fight the Americans, right? Like, hey, if you've escaped and you want to you get another chance to fight them, come join us and organize under the British and we'll help you do that. But it wasn't just all fighting men, right? It was like guys who would then bring their family. So there are a lot of women and children, older folks um, coming there too. And at the conclusion of the war, the British left. They had to pull out of the fort. And so when they did that, many of the people who had come to be under their protection, um, some decided to leave with the British Army, some decided to go elsewhere, but a few hundred people opted to stay behind and settle there, right? They were like, this is our territory. And remember, ostensibly, uh, at the end of the war, this area where this fort was, was Spanish-held territory, right? And so part of the reason why you would want to stay there is it's outside the jurisdiction of the u.s which meant that Jesus. you know the army can't come fight us but also um to avoid the slave catchers because there were a, a large group of them were freed slaves right or descendants of freed slaves so to reiterate it was now at this point um at the end of the war it was about a few hundred people 
really stationed in and around this fort and settled around the river, uh, many of whom were women and children, the families. Um, nonetheless, uh, there was a propaganda campaign that was started in uh, the South of the United States by slave owners and pro you know, slavery advocates who were starting to, you know, tell tall tales about this dangerous armed black army directly to their south that was encouraging, um, you know, slaves to run away and could possibly foment a, and a slave uprising. Um, and here's an example of one of those propaganda screeds from uh, an esteemed pro-slavery uh, publication called the Savannah Journal. Ooh, okay. Quote, it was not to be expected that an establishment so pernicious to the southern states, holding out to a part of their population temptations to insubordination, would have been suffered to exist after the close of the War of 1812. In the course of last winter, several slaves from this neighborhood fled to that fort. Others have lately gone from Tennessee and the Mississippi Territory. How long shall this evil, requiring immediate remedy, be permitted to exist? End quote. So, yeah. there was this... Uh, you know, this propaganda campaign that was circulated um, in the South and all of these frightened white slavers, um, they get together and they're like, OK, well, we need to raise an army to go take this fort. Who could we get to lead it? We know the U.S. federal government won't do it. Why don't we ask Andrew Jackson, hero of the War of 1812? And his response is like, of course I want to do that. And <laughs> so he he raises an army and he sends... <laughs> what I've been read in a couple of different historical places as like a formal diplomatic thing, but it's really a threat. He sends a thing to the Spanish governor and is like, I am going to go take out this fort. If you, if you can do it, I, I demand that you do it. And if you can't, I am going to send my army in to do it. And the Spanish are sort of bewildered. They don't know what to do. And so they just say, OK, they give him permission. They say, OK, you can go in and, and do what you want. So he raises his army, he gets a couple of gunboats, he goes down the river, and they reach the fort on July 27th, 1816. And now one of the American commanders on the gunboats, this uh, General Gaines, he sends out a request uh, when they get there to the fort that they surrender. And one of the leaders of the fort, which was a former slave by the name of Garcon, refuses, I think for pretty obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and so the Americans open fire from their gunboats, and Jesus. they're using uh, something called heated shot, which I have a feeling, Dwight, you might know what that is. Um, oh, yeah, I did one before we started. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, well, if you don't know, uh, back in those days of warfare, um, when you were using, you know, those big, like, iron cannons, mm -hmm. um, they would sometimes heat cannonballs over hot coals or Jesus open flames in order to make them red hot. The idea being, you know, most of the time in, in uh, naval warfare, even if you're fighting a fort, like, you're firing at stuff that's made out of wood, so you want to set it on fire. Um, so they did that, and that was the first shot that they fired on the fort, and when it hit the fort, it hit the stash of gunpowder that was in the fort, and it ignited and blew the entire fort to pieces in a single shot. And this, and this one cannonball shot has sometimes been called the most deadly cannonball in all of U.S. history. And so at that time, there were approximately 334 people inside the fort. And again, this included women and children. Jesus Christ. And about 270 of them were killed in the blast. Fuck! Uh, General Gaines, that guy who had demanded the surrender, later said in a report, quote, The explosion was awful and the scene horrible beyond description. You cannot conceive nor I describe the horrors of the scene. In an instant, lifeless bodies were stretched upon the plain, buried in sand or rubbish, or suspended from the tops of the surrounding pines. Here lay an innocent babe, there a helpless mother, on one side a sturdy warrior, on the other a bleeding squaw. Piles of bodies, large heaps of sand, broken glass, accoutrement, etc., covered the site of the fort. Our first care on arriving at the scene of the destruction was to rescue and relieve the unfortunate beings who survived the explosion. End quote. Um, now, curious thing about that last line he says there, where like our first you know priority was of course to help the wounded. In reality, Jackson went in and had many of the people who survived that explosion just shot on sight. Uh, the rest were sold back into slavery. The the people who had been horribly wounded in and survived this, um, you know, they recaptured them and they sold them back into slavery. Jesus Christ! Um, so. You know, after this uh, little event, of course, the Seminoles uh, never trusted the U.S. government again. Um, and so for the next few years, uh, 
you know, waged a war of resistance against them. And, and in response, Jackson then from there basically just took that army and kept doing the same thing to all the other Spanish forts, with the argument always being, well, the Spanish authorities here are not like subjugating the peoples that I want them to. That was like the sort of Cassus belly. That was his reasoning for doing this. Um, and in practice, you know, it led to these horrible massacres, but he took over most of the Spanish forts. Um, and it was finally formally recognized and handed over uh, from the Spanish to the Americans in the adams onice Treaty of 1819. And that's John Quincy Adams, by the way, who was Secretary of State oh. under President James Monroe at the time, and who himself would also later go on to become president. Um, uh, after this, there were also two later conflicts spanning over the 1830s, 40s, and 50s called the Second and Third Seminole Wars, um, basically just further consolidating uh, of the, the slaughter and, and chasing inland the remaining Seminoles people. Um, and so that's like a little brief history of how three American presidents violently stole Florida. Um, President Monroe hailed the adams onees Treaty as an example of the United States' rightful dominion over the Americas, something he would codify several years later into the Monroe da Doctrine, which mm -hmm. I think you'll yep. probably talk a little bit about, Dwight. Um, Jackson, again, was hailed as a hero for all of this. Um, obviously, he would later go on to become president, but at the time, he was immediately made the first territorial governor of Florida, and the white settlers were so pleased with how he had, quote, handled the situation that they named their new settlement in Northeast Florida Jacksonville. Fucking A. Which, of course, is still the Are major city there to this day, of course. Um, so, uh, two main the takeaways. By 10. Two main takeaways. Uh, uh, like I had mentioned, um, the conquest of Florida laid out the roadmap for future American annexations, uh, which was basically just to make up a bunch of lies, um, lie to your allies and enemies alike, just lay claim to territory, go mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. occupy it, and then slaughter everybody when it was convenient in a sort of bullying manner. And the second is that in the midst of this colonial violence, there's also this class violence. That's a part of it, right? Like these policies were driven largely by the large land owning slaver class who had sought to expand their plantations through a policy of extermination and displacement. And so when they couldn't get direct backing from the government, they would form their own local militias and go out and try to do violence. And then they, if they had their asses handed to them, which often happened, they would then run crying for help from the federal government who would then. <laughs> you know, offer them military support, which again is like largely how that class operates to this day. I, I was just right? like, exactly you know, like they do the same, the same fucking thing, right? You know, you go start some shit and then, you know, you call on the federal government to, uh, to, to help you. And I, I would also say too, one of the reasons why I was interested about this, you know, I read about this one for the first time, I think probably like 10 years ago. And it was really striking to me because, again, in U.S. history class, like you learn about like these kind of larger territorial expansions. Obviously, they're often talked about in glowing terms on like the actual mm -hmm. like violent wars of conquest that they are. But, um, you know, I never like learned about Florida uh, uh, as uh, even somebody, you know, who had family there and stuff like it was never taught to me or whatever. So um, and it's a really fucked up, horrible, brutal history um, that then uh, canonized and, and turned into heroes. Several uh, American politicians turned president. Jesus fucking Christ. How, like, I, I would just, like, wonder, like, like, is it even possible to calculate the amount of, uh, you know, political incidents in the United States are, are uh, you know, classified as massacres? Mm. Fuck. Like, I've never, like, <laughs> every one of us, you know, that's alive today have, are, 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 the, are the result of just countless generations of humans that lived and that made it. And so, and like when, when you talk about like, you know, women and children that were killed in this blast and shit, it's like, who remembers their story? Yeah. And, you know, and like, and like what, what, what significance did their life and, and untimely death have in like our, you know, uh, human history and story too. And it's just like, you know, thinking about the amount, the, just the countless amount of uh, people that died just at the hands of these fucking insane, you know, geopolitical pressures that are around them uh it's just so sick and it's only like in the last like 350 years mm. like it's just so incalculable i gotta take off my glasses okay uh i i think we're at the point now where we're uh gonna move a little farther into the 19th century and um 
You know, I, I haven't made it that much of a uh, of uh, of a secret that one of the things that I'm fascinated with most, uh, you know, within this project of Eat the Rich and and just in general personally is like maritime shit and and uh, international oh, yeah. trade. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, all right. The chorus of laughs come mm-hmm. about, and uh, you know, I I just find it so interesting to see how you know trade routes and shipping and and international trade have shaped our lives like way beyond anything any any one bit of our like individual decision making you know what i'm saying like th- there's just no like the reason that philadelphia and and baltimore are smaller cities than new york is like because the erie canal between albany and like the great lakes was so intensely effective at lowering the you know per ton or per pound cost of shipping you know inland you know from from the major port cities of the East Coast, like that's a huge fucking ramification that has changed the lives of like everybody, you know, the one fifth of Americans that live between the Washington Boston corridor and shit. It's wild. So those things like are exceedingly consequential. And so what I want to talk about today is probably one of the uh, not only one of the most consequential uh, construction projects in uh, human history. Which is the uh, the creation of the Panama Canal across the isthmus of Panama? That's a word I learned today, um, which just means a narrow strip of land. But uh, uh, but also Teddy Roosevelt and his um, uh, just wanton imagination, hell bent on 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 accomplishing this thing. So I want to talk about this a little bit because I didn't fucking realize how just like intensely consequential this was. In even shaping just like not only just literally severing a land bridge between two of the seven continents on Earth, <laughs> but like, but like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the political boundaries that are, uh, you know, at stake there at the time. Uh, oh, and by the way, I, I don't remember that I mentioned this, but not only this is one of the most uh, consequential construction projects in human history, but this is also one of the deadliest construction Mm -hmm. projects in human history as well Mm -hmm. which we'll talk about and i think i'll I'll just spoil the surprise right now i believe it's something like thirty thousand lives lost jesus christ just in this one project so uh you know i'm just gonna do kind of like a layman's explanation of like why this was uh, you know an extremely attractive thing for uh you know and and again shane you're speaking about the monroe doctrine of like the spheres of influence between Mm. the old world and the new world and this was very much part of like the american sort of manifest destiny uh uh to uh push the boundaries of 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 a nascently imperial america um beyond just its you know its its borders and so you know the 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 point of uh the panama canal or the idea of reducing the distance through which the uh, international shipping needed to go. I mean, the, it, to go from, you know, the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean required going all the way down below South America, the Drake Passage, terrifying seas. I mean, countless lives lost, you know, you know, just cargo at the bottom of the fucking cold, you know, South Southern Ocean and shit like that. I mean, just just a crazy way to get goods from you know one side of the earth to the other. So it had always been a uh, you know a, an idea uh, among the old and new world to reduce that by by some uh, by some way. And one of the ways to do that was something that the French had done earlier by cutting a hole through like the Sinai Peninsula uh, to create the Suez Canal, which allowed for goods to travel back and forth between the Red Sea and, you know, the Indian Ocean into the Mediterranean Sea. And this is something that the French had championed in, in Egypt. And so, you know, in order to do that, I mean, if you think about it, we've talked about this like since the inception of the show, like every, every capitalist looks at any transaction or any business model or whatever in a cost sheet mm-hmm. and you have your input prices and you have your shipping prices and you have your taxation prices and your insurance prices and all this stuff. And, you know, you take a look at it and, and this has been happening, obviously, increasingly in the, in the later part of the 20th century and now into the 21st century of the financialization of all of these transactions. And but but it has been happening, you know, throughout human history and certainly through trades, which is how much does my shipping cost? 
And uh, Teddy Roosevelt understood, you know, very, very importantly that, you know, for America to bolster its sphere of influence on, on the international stage, you know, in the late 18th century, uh, it would want to champion a project to cut a hole <laughs> through the isthmus of, uh, of Panama, which was at the time a part of Colombia, which we will talk about shortly. Um, so I want to uh, give a little bit of a, a, a background on this, and I'm going to pull on the PBS, a PBS article from a series that they had called The American Experience, and this is something called TR and the Panama Canal, Teddy Roosevelt and the Panama Canal. So I'm just going to read through a, a bunch of this, and we're going to talk about you know, where it goes from there. So it says here, on February 1st, 1881, driven by patriotic fervor and capitalized by over 100,000 mostly small investors, the French, ugh, here comes some more fucking French, Compagnie Universelle du Canal Interoceanique, that could be worse. Began That's way work. better than, than the French deserve, actually. That's way more respectful. <laughs> I know, I should have done it worse. Yeah. Uh, they began work on a canal that would cross the Colombian Isthmus of Panama and unite the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Ferdinand de Lesseps, a builder of the Suez Canal, led the project. Uh, you know, he made a career for himself. His plan for, called for a sea-level canal to be dug along the path of, Panama, of the Panama Railroad, some 50 miles in length. Uh, that's, you know, the, the term isthmus is like, you know, a, a narrow strip of land. So yeah, 50 miles is actually quite fucking small. The canal would be less than half as long as the Suez. De Lesseps uh, and estimated that the job would cost about $132 million and take 12 years to complete. Which is funny, just as an aside, because didn't it cost like $4 billion to extend the Q train from like 70-something street up to like 125th <laughs> street or whatever it is, like or 96th street or something like that? It's just crazy. Anyway, Europeans had dreamed of a Central American canal as early as the 16th century. President Ulysses S. Grant sent seven expeditions to study the feasibility of such work. As travel and trade in the Western Hemisphere increased, the need for a canal grew increasingly more obvious. Ships navigated around Cape Horn, the treacherous southern extremity of South America. A New York to San Francisco journey measured some 13,000 miles and took months. A canal across Panama would save incalculable miles and man hours. It would also, Ferdinand de Lesseps believed, make its stockholders rich, just as the Suez had uh, done for its investors. Ample evidence supported de Lesseps' claims the tiny cross Pan Panama railway had made in excess of $7 million in their first six years of operation, and that construction of the railroad had cost upwards of 6,000 lives, which failed to dampen de Lesseps' enthusiasm. Now, the French hacked a broad pathway through the jungle from coast to coast, and on January 1882, commenced digging. They commanded an impressive array of modern equipment from steam shovels, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we're, we're skipping down, we're skipping down. But what was the problem? The crew discovered that the real Panama mile upon mile of impassable jungle, day upon day of torrential rain, insects, snakes, swamps, hellish heat, smallpox, malaria, and yellow finger, fucking yellow finger, and yellow <laughs> fever. Leave it in, place. leave it in. Yellow finger. Fucking yellow finger. God damn it. We're leaving it in. Hey, uh, uh, Teresa, come over here. I think I got, I got yellow finger. I got yellow finger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so, I mean, ext extremely treacherous shit, and it continues here saying mudslides buried men, supplies, and machines just totally fucked up. Uh, there were an enormous amount of people that died uh, from these mosquito-borne illnesses. Three out of four men hospitalized at Ancon, which is an area of the, uh, you know, the construction zone, died. It said, despite massive investments that had been made, the hospital among the finest in the tropical world. This is so weird. Any, the, anyway, the point is, at some point, it became increasingly obvious that this was a venture that just simply was not going to work. But Teddy Roosevelt would soon take up the cause. Shortly after ascending to the presidency, Roosevelt spoke of the Panama Canal in a speech to Congress. No single great material work which remains to be undertaken on this continent is as of such consequence to the American people. And he acted quickly. In 1902, the United States reached an agreement to buy the rights from the French Canal and equipment 
for a sum not to exceed $40 million. I mean, a bargain comparatively. The U.S. then began negotiating a Panama Treaty with Colombia, right? Because this was a Colombian territory. The U.S. Department of War would direct excavation. Many, both in the press and the public, sensed a scandal, or worse, good money thrown after bad. Now let's start to get the fucking, uh, the, the consent machine uh, crank in here. In the New York Journal, William Randolph Hearst opined. Mm-hmm. He wrote an opinion piece that said, The only way we could secure a satisfactory concession from Columbia would be to go down there, take the contending statesmen by the necks, and hold a batch of them in office long enough to get a contract in mind. Hell My yeah. gout is acting up. I Real need. sicko shit, man. Pass me the iodine. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the part that fucking blew my mind. When Colombia grew reticent in its negotiations, right? Colombia wasn't so hot on this. Roosevelt and the Panamanian business interests collaborated. How else would we do this, guys, in Central America? Collaborate to create a revolution. Mm-hmm. The battle for Panama lasted only a few hours. Colombian soldiers in Cologne were bribed $50 each to lay down their arms, and the USS Nashville, a naval warship, cruised off the Panamanian coast in a show of support. On November 3rd, 1903, the nation of Panama was born. It took less than 72 hours. And for the record, uh, pa- the, the day of Panamanian independence to this day is celebrated on November 3rd. It took less than 72 hours from Roosevelt sending down the warship, putting troops on the ground, arming the militias there, and, and giving the money to bribe the Colombian soldiers that were there you know, to be in charge of maintaining the territory for the Colombian government, it took less than 72 hours for America to recognize the newly minted Republic of Panama as a new country. And for the record, too, uh, you know, at the time where the, the legislative body of, of, of Colombia was, um, was deliberating this, Roosevelt said, you know, before when, when they were causing some static and was, you know, creating a roadblock for Roosevelt, Roosevelt said, I do not think that the Bogota lot of jackrabbits should be allowed permanently to bar one of the future highways of civilization. Just fucking insane. And the fact that they, they, like, this is what, they sent a warship, they created the country of Panama just to do this. So it continues here and it says, the U.S. quickly assumed parental interest. Americans had written the Panamanian constitution in advance. The wife mm. of the pro-canal lobbyist Philippe Bunau Baria had sewn the country's first flag, and a payment of ten million dollars secured a canal zone and rights to build. The uh, uh, Bunau Baria, installed as the Panian, Panamanian minister to the United States, signed a treaty of favorable uh, uh, American interests, and the forty million dollars given to J.P. Morgan for distribution to French stockholders disappeared amid rumors of larcenous speculation. I I, Like, (laughs) are you fucking kidding me? All of our old friends. Now, this is where it gets funny. In 1904, the Americans' first year in Panama, it mirrored the French disaster. The chief engineer, a guy named Findlay, Findlay Wallace, neglected to organize the effort or develop an action plan. The food was putrid, The living conditions abysmal, and political red tape put a stranglehold on appropriations. There was disease, and three out of four Americans that were there to do construction booked a passage home. So a replacement came for this, you know, Finley Wallace guy, a guy named John Stevens, and it changed everything. Stevens had been famous for building the Great Northern Railroad across the Pacific Northwest. And in a rough territory from Canada to Mexico, he had proven his tenacity and his new plan of action would save the canal. That was the hopes of it, at least. And it said the kind of work that needed to be done, Stephen reasoned, could only be done by a well-housed, well-fed, disease-free labor force. So they started work not by digging, but by cleaning. Check this shit out. Dr. William Gorgas, a guy who had helped eradicate yellow fever in Havana by killing mosquitoes that carried it directed sanitation efforts how did they do that they drained swamp they swept drainage ditches they paved roads and installed plumbing they sprayed pesticides by the ton and entire towns rose out of the jungle what they don't talk about here is that they basically took crude oil 
and spilled it all over the jungle to poison the water so that mosquitoes wouldn't be able to spawn. And all of this was so that, uh, you know, men that were sent down there to, uh, to do the work would not die of fucking yellow, yellow fever and dengue fever and malaria, you know, all the uh, uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. And then there, I, I'm just skipping ahead here and just in, in um, you know, in interest of time, there was a concern over the sea level plan to do this, right? Sea level meaning like you just sail into the actual canal. But what was more economical was a series of locks, right? So how locks work is like these enormous doors basically are built and you as a vessel come into one of the locks, the door closes behind you, seawater is either drained or poured into the lock to raise or lower your position in the water, and then the next lock is, is opened. And it goes like that through the entirety of the Panama Canal. That's how it, that's how it is to this day. That's how my bathroom works, too. <laughs> that's good. Uh, so by 1905, so several years, yellow fever had been officially eradicated on the Isthmus of Panama. And in, no- in November 1906, that was good. In November 1906, Roosevelt visited the canal and he did a, like a fucking photo op uh, at the controls of this big shovel. And by the way, that was the first time that an American president had left the country while in office. A, a, a name that you might recognize, Shane, Colonel George Washington Gothels, uh-huh. an army engineer with experience building lock type canals, assumed the chief engineer's post. That was the Stevens guy had resigned. He was the um, he was the governor of the Canal Zone also for a while, I believe, wasn't he? That, yes, I yeah. believe you're correct. So anyway, uh, you know, this was I, I don't want to belabor it too much, but this continued, this continued, and it was extremely uh, uh, difficult for them to to do. And I want to just switch here to the human toll of the Panama Canal, and I'm reading here from CanalMuseum.com which is, you know, a website that, you know, catalogs all of the human toll that was here. And it says here, by August 15, 1914, the Panama Canal was officially opened by the passing of the SS Ancon. At the time, no single effort in American history had exacted such a price in dollars or in human life. The American expenditures from 1904 to 1914 totaled $352 million, which adjusted for inflation is like, you know, obviously many multitudes more expensive than that far more than the cost of anything built by the United States government up until that time. Together, the French and American expenditures totaled, and of course the French was trying to do this ahead of time, uh, totaled $640 million. It is estimated that over 80,000 persons took part in, took part in the construction and that 30,000 lives were lost, both in the French and American efforts. Now, on those lives lost, I want to talk a little bit about Alfred Nobel. You might mm-hmm. recognize that name um, because of the Nobel Prize. Why is there a Nobel Prize? Was he noted for being some sort of philanthropist? Well, yes, he is now. But what people may not understand about him is that he invented dynamite, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is basically it's like a stabilized nitroglycerin made into like a paste that's then extruded into these, you know, s- sticks that we think of now when you think of like sticks of dynamite. I have some right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> now, hang on. <laughs> Uh, and and just to just to flesh this out in case you were curious um his father emmanuel was uh he basically invented naval mines which were used in the crimean war Mm -hmm. in the 1800s so you know came from some interesting stock he was he was a very wealthy uh swedish man um but i want to talk about you know i learned about this a long time ago on some like fucking history channel shit and basically, like, what the story is, is that, like, he was so wrought with guilt mm-hmm. about his, you know, his contribution to Earth and, you know, the fact that his use of dynamite, list, uh, you know, resulted in the deaths of many, many, yeah. many thousands of people, which definitely was true. Um, and that, you know, he wanted to create a philanthropic thing that would stand the test of time and that would he would be known for because he was so sad with guilt. But, of course... This wasn't exactly, uh, you know, accurate because it seemed like what? he was. What? Yeah, this well, wasn't a on. cynical <laughs> attempt to launder his reputation. Yeah, so that's exactly what it was. I'll, I'll just save. I'll spare everybody. I'll spare everybody the uh, the actual story. But what I want to talk about specifically is who were the men that in the Panama Canal were the ones that handled the dynamite. This was the most 
you know, the, the most dangerous part of the process. Well, I'll give you a hint. It wasn't the white dudes that were down there. And I'm just reading here from a uh, website, which is called the, Her- the Silver People Heritage Foundation. It says, this blog is dedicated to the restoration and preservation of the West Indians in the culture and the history of Panama. And so this article says here, uh, that was written by a woman named Lydia, called Alfred Nobel and the Dynamite Trail to Panama. This is from 2013. So I'm going to read here uh, from part of it that says, There were the drillers who might have also functioned as powder men who drilled holes into the sides of rocky crags, very common in Panama's terrain. The dynamite sticks were then placed in these holes, all linked by wires that were connected to a central switch area where the detonation took place. Frank also noted that this is a, somebody that was a, um, a census taker back then in 1912. Uh, Frank noted that the blasts were set off at 11.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. when, quote, workmen were out of range, but there were also many accidental detonations that took the lives of too many men to make us aware that safety restrictions were not always observed. The noise from the blasts, to say least, was deafening. Said the switchmen, says Frank, were usually black men, and just before a blast they would take cover under, quote, sheet iron wigwams for protection from flying rock. Frank rather flippantly narrated about how some of these powder men, or drillers, would handle the dynamite sticks in an uncomfortably nonchalant manner, making them the brunt of jokes among the white men and were considered individuals of generally just steer clear of. So what they're saying here is like the, the people, the, the generally black people that would be handling the dynamite were kind of like flippantly, you know, uh, handling them. They were just like, you know, a little bit uh, careless with them. But why? It says... Whenever white men would hear the approach of these intrepid souls, they would immediately clear the path or head in the opposite direction. And this woman writes, It was my impression that they believed that West Indians to be almost suicidal in the handling of dynamite, but I'm more convinced that their Yankee foreman did not give them adequate training in the safe handling of this material until much later and after much loss of life, West Indian life. It says, I'll quote uh, an article giving you a picture. It says here, Sometimes, much to the horror of the workmen and foremen alike, the dynamite was so volatile as to warrant only a slight move to detonate its destructive force. Until the Canal Administration and Engineering Department got together to enforce more scientific handling of this highly volatile material, hundreds of men were being killed year after unforgettable year, and those who survived were often gruesomely injured. One of the worst explosions, in fact, occurred on the 12th of December in 1908 at Basso Bispo and the west bank of the Culebra Cut. It was one of those very lethal, quote, premature explosions and left in its wake 23 men killed and 40 injured. Most of the accidental explosions, in fact, occurred at Basso Bispo. So, uh, and, and to, to uh, flesh this out, Chris, as you, were, uh, as you were surmising there, it said, influenced by Countess Bertha Kinski, his lifelong th- friend who became increasingly critical of the arms race, Alfred Nobel included in his final will and provision for a generous prize for persons or organizations who promoted peace. Oh, bullshit. Fuck you. <laughs> okay, so Teddy Roosevelt, president of the United States in the, in the turn of the, to the 20th century, had this kind of like manifest destiny of the idea that, you know, American imperialism and capitalism, Western capitalism at, uh, writ large, would be greatly benefited by having a decrease in the cost of shipping between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. And he was right, regardless of the, you know, the human toll cost. But I would also just like to uh, bring up quickly. Oh, hang on. I have one one thing that, uh, uh, Chris, I think this is, this will tickle you. Sure, sure. I watched a few minutes of this Ken Burns documentary on the Panama Canal. Uh Uh-huh. And this voice comes on, and I, and I, I just did like a little transcript of what the voice says. I have an idea. Okay. And the voice says, the, the Panama Canal is one of the great achievements of the human race. <laughs> Wonderfully achieved, brilliantly executed. The ancillary benefits were enormous. One of the thing, it's one of the things that America did to affirm its greatness. It's better to do that in that way rather than just conquering people. Mm. Mm. And then it cuts to George Will. Oh, George Will. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say John McCain because John McCain was born in the Canal Zone. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I forgot yeah, about he is that. A, uh, he was a Zonian, as they, um, as they, as they called Christ. themselves. It's interesting. It's worth um, kind of mentioning as well that the, the Panama Canal stayed you know, firmly under <laughs> United States control until 
like the year 2000. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, it's uh, uh, um, interesting because there were, um, you know, it was basically a, 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 a zone totally under under U.S. control. There were still, there were, you know, American expatriates that, that lived there for, for a long time as well. There were, um, you know, there were a, a, a group there. Um, they called themselves Zonians, like I mentioned. Um, uh, John McCain was, was born there. Um, but there was this sort of long long-standing sort of... Um, you know, obviously tension between the, the native Panamanians and these, um, um, you know, American expatriates who, um, you know, pretty much um, sort of ran everything and the, uh, the the zone was was under American control. Um, and they didn't start sort of the Americans didn't start um, kind of giving concessions to the to the uh, Panamanians until the early 60s. In fact, it was it was Kennedy who um, very generously decreed that the Panamanian flag could be flown alongside the American flag in the canal zone um, Jesus Christ. at schools and like non, you know, like civilian, um, like non-military um, places. Unfortunately, Kennedy was assassinated before that could be, <laughs> before that could um, take effect. And the governor of the American governor of the canal zone at the time, um, like went back on that and, and said that, no, we're not going to let the, the, the Panamanian flag fly. We're going to take the American it flag down but we're not going to let the panamanian flag fly it's going to be neither of them right Jesus. and <laughs> and so stupid it's so mind. stupid it's the stupidest dumbest like dumb guy thing like move ever and um i love deals <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so you know, obviously this pissed pissed um, native uh, Panamanians off, and uh, people started um, sort of like as an act of, of resistance, you know, um, raising the flag of Panama without you know authorization at these at schools and um, uh, I believe like libraries, places like that. It was it was um, just like civilian infrastructure places where they wanted to fly their own fucking flag in their own in their own country. So they started um, kind of doing this in protest. The uh, Zonians, the American expatriates, they also started um, doing the same thing, like flying the American flag in in protest. And it basically all led to this long um, uh, incident where like a bunch of um, students from Panama, they were going to sort of like as this sort of like demonstration um, to, uh, you know, fly the to raise the, the flag of Panama in front of uh, one of the one of the schools there in the area. And the, the fucking Jesus Americans Christ. like like basically, I guess, like surrounded the flagpole and like linked arms and sang the Star Spangled Banner and wouldn't let them raise the flag. And it turned into this like scuffle over the uh, over the Panamanian flag. The, the flag of Panama was was ripped. It was torn. It was a historic flag, too. It wasn't just any flag. It was like a, a historic flag that uh, I believe was made out of silk or something. And it was ripped in this scuffle. And then as word of this spread, this kind of kicked off this, um, you know, period of, uh, of more widespread protests against the Americans around around the country, which um, ultimately ended in people essentially being massacred by the by the United States military. They killed, I think, like two dozen people uh, over the uh, course of a few days during these um, during this this social unrest. And um, but that was like the you know, that was like the very beginning of just just considering actually giving you know sovereignty and control of this land back to the uh, back to Panama uh, this was in the the mid 60s that didn't actually happen until uh, it was Carter <laughs> Carter in 1977 did actually agreed to give it back to to Panama but not for another um, not for another 23 years uh, it actually went into effect I believe like December 31st 1999 or something like that mm-hmm. is when Panama finally got control back of that area a fucking joke man <laughs> again like you know the, the the fact that like in the 1800s or you know in the early 1900s that um you know that Roosevelt was just like the 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 brazen disregard for like individual sovereignty of like anybody it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah it doesn't matter this is just like the idea of this was just born out of it's like, all America baby mm-hmm. yeah. it's all America <laughs> but it's just, it's the funniest thought to me of like a, a bunch of like fucking just dumb like sons and daughters of of, of like Americans who who built the canal and who just like still live there and think they fucking own the place <laughs> like linking arms around this flagpole. Singing the Star Spangled <laughs> Banner. It's such a funny, dumb thought to me to imagine. Can, that. can you imagine too? Like I can so easily picture that. <laughs> oh, oh, I, but like putting yourself on the line to like sing the fucking Star Spangled Banner. Right. 
Right. Like that's I mean, your big act of defiance. It's, it's this, you know, to create a linking thread here, it's the same pattern that yeah. I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. just going someplace you have no business being, right. announcing that it's part of America, and then just like doing violence to the people there under the guise <laughs> right. of patriotism. And saying, you know, right. like just assaulting the locals, being like, you know, six semper tyrannus. <laughs> like, <laughs> <you> know, like, <laughs> So, you know, this got me thinking, and of course, you know, we, we I think about this a lot and talk about it frequently whenever I can about, like, the Industrial Revolution and its consequences. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, the... the so the, it occupies your mind. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do. But, the, you know, I spent a lot of time about... writing letters to... to All right. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of, like, you know, how international shipping has you know, created this massive superstructure and, and, and apparatus for enabling capital to accumulate, and, and in a way to do so that is unnaturally competitive, I think is a way that I would want to put it, which is like, you know, even just saying like, hey, we need shirts to wear in the United States, and, you know, that requires, requires textiles and the, manufa- the manufacture and fabrication of textiles. Mm-hmm. Which requires labor. Again, we like think about this as a capitalist, like looking at a cost sheet and like the input costs and all that stuff and the potential gross profit. Uh, you know, but it allows for us to say, like, hey, you know, the shirt that I'm wearing right now, like, may have come from Bangladesh or Vietnam or something like that, and that may have come in a container vessel through the Panama Canal, being and it's allowed to do so because it doesn't have to go through the fucking great the, the the Drake Passage. Like there's just massive implications from this. And now that we are the kind of like m- millennials, I'm saying specifically, are the kind of like mezzanine generation, you know, between those that like grew up in a pre climate change ish world and are going to die in a climate change world and you know now the zoomers and and the generation alpha or whatever the youngest kids are called are going to deal with actually the consequences of the industrial revolution uh a lot of this is exacerbated by the ability for like these fucking you know just countless tons of bunker oil being burned by international uh vessels and specifically and i'll introduce if you're not familiar with this now i'll introduce the term to you uh, Panamax vessels. Panamax meaning uh, the maximum size vessel, uh, big enough that it can, you know, economically bring things, you know, transport goods across the earth, but also small enough to fit through the Panama Canal. So Panamax vessel, the maximum amount of, you know, gross tonnage that is able to go through the canal. So there are an enormous amount of uh, environmental implications on just this, you know, 100-year-old, 120-year-old uh, consequence of having the canal. And I'm going to talk about a few of the direct consequences right now, one of which is just the sheer environmental impact of invasive species and watershed implications. And I'm reading from a Guardian article here from 2007. Um, and it's titled Changing Course, the expansion of the Panama Canal without a thorough impact assessment has led to fears of species migration and water shortages. And just I'm just going to go through it real quickly. It says here, these efforts have focused on preserving the jungles that make up the watershed for the rivers that supply the canal. Some of the most species rich forests in the world, flora and fauna historically endemic to South and North America, have mixed and evolved in Panama, resulting in tremendous biodiversity. But Deforestation threatens more than the tourist dollar or endangered species. Check this out, guys. Each time a ship passes through the canal, 52 million gallons of fresh water, enough for a day's supply for a small city, is discharged from the locks into the ocean. Mm-hmm. It comes back in, though, right? There's no, that's like, no big deal. Re- <laughs> like, wrap your head around that for a second. Each time a vessel goes through, it's 52 million gallons of fresh water. Again, that's how my bathroom went. <laughs> but... And this is before, by the way, there's, you know, since 2014, there's been a, uh, an effort to make a new Panamax, which is a 25% expansion of the width mm-hmm. and breadth of the, uh, of the Panama Canal. The girth. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it says this water comes from the canal's watershed. And if this is that's denuded of trees and it's laden with silt and it's unpredictable surges, 
The silt raises the bottom of the man-made lakes designed to storage and critically reduces the capacity. It's just like the, the amount of environmental devastation just from the ongoing use of this thing is incalculable. And there's other issues. Uh, and, and I'm going to read here from a Smithsonian Institute uh, article from 2014 called Could Expanding the Panama Canal Increase Risk of Invasion? And, you know, uh, just to I'll just sum it up because we in interest of time, uh, shipping vessels use something called ballast and basically they suck up water. And depending on where cargo is in, uh, you know, in the front or, you know, the fucking uh, forward or aft in the vessel or starboard or port or whatever, you bring water into the vessel to counteract and balance out the vessel so that it, you know, it sails well, right? But that water isn't just water, right? You're sucking up the native biome from which you're sailing, right? So if you're, uh, if you're going from Thailand or Vietnam or, or Japan or something like that, you suck up all that uh, water and you go all the way to San Francisco or New York or Norfolk, Virginia or, or Jacksonville, Florida, and, uh, or the Great Lakes or something like that, and you discharge the ballast because you're, you're taking on more cargo you know, the, the other cargo or your discharging cargo or whatever, all of that flora and fauna in that uh, ballast water goes into the local biome. And this is where we get things like zebra mussels in, uh, in the Great Lakes, which have caused billions of dollars of, you know, erosion. And it basically turned it into like a water desert of a lack of flora and fauna because of the out, com- out competition that these zebra mussels do. Or different, I mean, ev- everywhere across the United States. I didn't realize this, but fucking worms aren't even uh, native to the United States, to North America. That was the European worm. And now we're dealing with the Asian jumping worm, which is a whole other, like, worm that's, like, out-competing the, the, Euro- the European worm and the, our local forests and shit like that. It's, like, a, just a countless... Go ahead. Is that also your bathroom, Shane? <laughs> no, I was going to say, that's just the free market, baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, let, let the best worm win. <laughs> it's, it's, again, like an incalculable thing. And the point of the Panama Canal is when you shorten the distance between, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the loading port and the discharging port, well, that allows for those things, less time for those things to die, and it will create these biofouling events. So that you know, that the- is how my bathroom works. <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't do it again, but that, that specifically is. Anyway, again, at, at the time, like no one thought about the environmental implications of what like a shortened and inefficiencyed, you know, international trade would do. But Teddy Roosevelt, our, our sainted president, who Obama, by the way, you, you know, that uh, show comedians and cars getting coffee with uh, Jerry Seinfeld. But he's like, um. You know, who's one of your favorite presidents? And Obama's like, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was an interesting character. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt would go up to Yellowstone Park for like a month, and nobody knew where he was. Nobody could get in touch with him. Can you imagine that? Wait a minute. In office? In office. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Boy, that's a lot of messages when you get back. <laughs> I'm like, and I, and I think about that now, like learning everything that I have done about the Panama Canal. And I'm like, how could you even fucking say that? Like, <laughs> I think Elizabeth Warren said a similar thing. He's kind Ugh. of like a popular go-to for like p- past presidents when you're asked like, who's your favorite president? Because there's always this like weird like tough man machismo yes. thing attached to him. And and it's funny. I mean, with all the the environmental devastation you're talking about just from this one event, you know, the other thing that like Teddy Roosevelt is like supposedly you know known for is his like conservation yeah efforts. well it's like, right, that's his, right. Well, his uh, teddy roosevelt's idea of conservationism was like preserving the fucking jungle so he could go hunt lions in it <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly exactly i read something about him where he would just like and i think i think obama says this in that show where he was just like he would just disappear for a month while he's in office <laughs> <laughs> like, it used to be so easy to do yeah you would just and and, and it was a thing like he would just go to like uh like he would just leave his wife and go to the dakotas and just like shoot bison until you know he ran out of whiskey or whatever and <laughs> went back to washington also he was the head of the nypd there's like there's like so much to talk about with, with I, him. I have i yeah i have something for him but um it, i think it works better as a segue into chris so if you if yeah you yeah more, I'm, I'm, I'm done i'm, I'm done okay, i'm off okay. of this 
everybody blah 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 dwight and boats okay go ahead okay go ahead no i was just gonna say the other the other thing that i always think about with roosevelt is um because uh, this is one of the things we were talking about and kind of preparing all of our different bits for this show is that, like you know the the just the like astronomical amount of like assassinations and assassination mm-hmm. attempts that have been yes. made <laughs> against like sitting presidents mm-hmm. um in, in in u.s history and um Roosevelt was was one of those who was wounded um, in his assassination attempt. Very famously, it was it was after he was had already been president. He was running again right. as president of like the, the new whatever, party. progressive yeah. party. Yeah, yeah, right, right, it. right. And um, I think it was like 1912, and he and he was like about to make a speech somewhere in the Midwest, maybe Wisconsin, and um, he was like shot, and he had his fucking script for his speech was like 50 pages long, and the sh- the bullet like went through it. And then, like, <laughs> it still wounded him, but then he, like, you know, he was supposed to, he, like, calmed down the crowd and was like, you know, no, don't, like, uh, attack the guy, you know, just apprehend him. And then he's like, I'm going to finish him out of speech here. anyway. <laughs> yeah. And so he went and he finished his speech with the, like, blood <laughs> seeping into his Jesus vest. Jesus Christ. And that's one of those things that's always, you know, picked up as, like, a, oh, what a, you know, he was a tough guy. And it's like, what a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, go insane. to the hospital. Literally insane. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what is wrong with yeah. you? It's in 1912. Yeah. <laughs> the, the bullet is just like pure lead. Yeah. Like, <laughs> go, go, well, you know, when you when you get hit in the liver uh, from, a, from a bullet, but, you know, because of the time period, your liver, your liver is, you know, uh, ensconced in aluminum, leached aluminum from your fucking diet of eating bauxite or whatever, because that's what the... Uh, elk that you were eating was eating <laughs> wait, you know, wait this is this is this is pretty funny um i, I didn't know this the uh it says here just reading from wikipedia the would-be assassin claimed that william mckinley had visited him in a dream and told him to avenge his assassination by killing roosevelt which is oh my god <laughs> it's making a lot of really good points yeah. <laughs> yeah i i watched a uh, taxi driver and i saw william mckinley <laughs> in it and i thought uh, you know i <laughs> I could really do something, you know. I had some bad what, ideas what? in my head. <laughs> One I day, guess if, uh, <laughs> we need a rain to cleanse this earth. You know? <laughs> well, not now, but someday you got to do that in the Biden voice. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was her name? Jod- Loris? Jodie Foster? Who are you talking about? Yeah, what, what, what was her name in the show? Uh, the character, Iris? Was it Iris? Iris. Yeah, Iris. Yeah. yeah. You know, Iris. <laughs> You don't have to do this. <laughs> don't go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that script really well. I, I'm cool. I, I'm cool. I, I got <laughs> to get organized. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So let me. So I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, uh, move right along here to uh, to close this out with uh, with my section. And um, what, do you, what does that mean to close us out? Uh, I'm sorry. To play Chris. us out. To play us out. <laughs> What do you mean? Um, Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah, this is going to be. I, I, I've kind of. I've got one main kind of uh, uh, anecdote I wanted to to sort of focus on, but I, I I'm going to do. I think a little bit of a. I decided to kind of do a little bit of a, a lightning round here because I, I had I had several things I, I was just kind of stirring around in my head. I think I probably told you guys like three different things that I was going to do, um, and I couldn't decide on one. So I, I do have a a, a a main topic, but I wanted to. I would be remiss if I if I didn't just uh, sort of quickly tell a couple of my uh, favorite anecdotes about um, uh, about two particular presidents. One is Richard Nixon, who I'm just obviously um, incredibly <laughs> fascinated by. Um, oh, yeah. But there's a, 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 so much good Nixon lore that's out there. There is a, a particularly uh, a, a funny story to me where he – it was like early – it was in 1970. It was like May 1970. Um, like the the um, Kent State shootings had happened like four or five days earlier. Mm. You know, Nixon was getting a lot of um, there was a lot of protests. There was a lot of um, you know unhappiness with the uh, expanding the the Vietnam War into Cambodia, which had just sort of been become um, sort of publicly known. So he was sort of facing a lot of a lot of heat for this. Um, it was um, yeah May eighth. May eighth. I looked it up. Is is when this was. So May May eighth. He he has a, a press conference. Um, that night where he's just like sort of hounded about the, um, you know, this is decision to, to expand the war into Cambodia. 
And so he, he gets done with this um, this press conference. He goes back to the White House and he, he like makes a bunch of fucking um, phone calls to like friends of his and stuff. He calls Billy Graham and, and, and like uh, among nice. among people that he that he called. Um, and then he 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 falls asleep at like two a.m. and he um, sleeps for like an hour and a half and then um, wakes up in almost like what seems like a like a manic state or something. He wakes up at like four in the morning <laughs> and then he, he, he plays, he like puts on a um, like a record of like some fucking classical music or whatever and starts like fucking blasting it in the White Delightful. House and then he, um, so that woke up his um, his personal assistant. Uh, it was a guy named uh, Manolo Sanchez. It was um, uh, his long time, like not just while he was in the White House, like his long time personal assistant like from the early 60s through the 80s and he, he woke him up and then and the um and then nixon's like have you ever visited the lincoln memorial at night you know and like he's like no <laughs> <laughs> and he's like okay we're gonna go and then they like get in the car and um um he gets this guy to drive him over to the to lincoln memorial because there's there's student protesters there uh there's anti-vietnam protesters there and he wants to go fucking like schmooze and 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 meet the meet the protesters and and um i guess hear them out or, or whatever so um yeah so they they go over to the uh to the lincoln memorial the Secret Service is completely taught, caught off guard by this and is horrified <laughs> that, I love that, this it. Is, I love it so that this is happening. Um, and so they go over to the uh, to, to the to the Lincoln Memorial. Um, it's like five in the morning. He's he's meeting the like the, the student protesters. Um, he's he like meets some some students from uh, Syracuse University and like. Um, their, their description later about it, about the conversation with him, is that like when he like pretended like he wanted to hear our concerns, but then when we said we were from Syracuse, all he wanted to do was talk about the school's football team, and he just like turned the conversation completely to <laughs> to being about football. Um, there's another another funny quote from from Nixon himself as he's like describing this this um, um, this incident later. He's like. Um, He's like he said to them, like I know most of you probably think I'm an sob, but I, I want you to know I understand just how you feel. Um, <laughs> and then he goes on to, I'm also on amphetamine. <laughs> yeah, almost certainly. There's something. There's something going on here. There's there's something. Right. Uh, I don't know what exactly is going on here. I always assumed he was probably drunk or something. I have no idea. Um, yeah, yeah. That but then he, right, um, right. I guess he like starts talking to the students, like telling them to go to Prague and, and Warsaw and like praising like the architecture of, of Europe and, and stuff like that and telling them to go travel and um, this is what they took from us <laughs> yeah yeah but then the, the funniest the funniest part is is finally he um I, I guess the secret serve like secret service like you know they're getting fucking nervous obviously this this a, a crowd is um the crowd around the president is getting you know larger and larger and then finally they sort of um kind of make him leave and then um as he's leaving um this guy um as, as nixon described him a, a bearded fellow from detroit um like called out for oh, his boy. um you know wanted to uh, to get his picture taken taken with them and this this picture is uh it's out there it's like already the sun has has come up they're in front of the lincoln memorial the guy in this picture has um later said in in interviews that he was like so high on LSD when that picture was taken <laughs> <laughs> is this, this guy looks like uh Brian Wilson yeah. in 1974 so. <laughs> yeah yeah so i like that one that's a that's a good story oh and then they yeah then they um oh yeah then he then then he he made the guy drive him to Con Congress and they like and Nixon like sat in like the empty fucking he sat in his old seat as a congressman and he had his fucking um assistant like make a speech for him or yeah, whatever. He's definitely he was definitely <laughs> drunk. <laughs> he was um, definitely talk drunk. Talk about checkers. <laughs> yeah. And then they yeah, then they uh they met uh, fucking uh, Bob Holderman and met some other um some folks at the uh, Mayflower Hotel and, and had breakfast and then uh, eventually they got Nixon back into the car and and, and finally co- corralled they, him. They shot him with Thorazine. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the real, <laughs> a really funny thing is that is car. that apparently like he he wanted to walk like from after breakfast he wanted to walk back to the to the White House and like sir we can't let you do that like you have to like, dude wouldn't on. it be funny if we just like walked all the way back <laughs> yeah Constitution Avenue dude let's totally do it <laughs> so they uh, it was so funny yeah so they made him they made him get to the car and um 
and that's that. Um, I always uh, I always did like that story. Another another anecdote I wanted to, to tell you real quick is about um, about Lyndon Johnson. I actually think I might have mentioned this one on the on the show before. Oh, um, yeah, I know which one you're gonna say. But Lyndon but Johnson is. Um, I mean, we've all sort of heard this, the stories about Johnson fucking like pulling his dick out and like making his um, his aides like um, you know like go into the bathroom with him while he took a shit and and, and stuff like Jesus that. But he. Uh, a man who definitely knew the, um, you know, knew how to harness the power of his uh, shitting, um, which he did very <laughs> effectively um, one time. This was um, at his ranch. There was a New York Times and, and Cy Hirsch, Seymour Hirsch, has, has told this story. That's where I, that's where I've heard this. Um, but apparently, another a New York Times reporter named Tom Wicker, who Johnson, I guess, was not particularly um, fond of at the time because of things he the thing, things that he'd written about him, and he was in the uh, this journalist was in the in the, the press pool at uh, Lyndon Johnson's ranch, and apparently, as the story goes, Lyndon Johnson um, pulled up in his uh, in his car and um, like rolled the window down, motioned for this guy to get in the car with him, and then sort of just wordlessly. Um, Kind of drove him across his property and then stopped the car, got out of the car, sort of half-heartedly crouched down behind some bushes, but like in plain view, then took a shit like right in front of this guy and wiped his ass with leaves and then like got back in the car again, wordlessly <sighs> dropped him back over to the press pool and just like dropped him off. <laughs> it's just like this strange fucking intimidation um, tactic in, in some sort of weird uh, way. Like he's in, you know, he's in a car on his own property. There's no <laughs> reason why he has to shit behind the bushes um what is uh, fucking wrong and also with to, to pick this guy up to do it um well having like well making decisions of life and right. death over the entire like <laughs> southeast asian yeah. peninsula yeah. <laughs> it's just like this is his priority yeah i know i know that's poison sumac <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so what what I finally kind of decided I wanted to uh, kind of expand expand on a little bit was the um, I started kind of thinking about some 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 would be assassins, right? Like Shane, as you as you mentioned, the uh, uh, story of uh, of Teddy Roosevelt famously sort of. Um, uh, uh, getting shot and, and surviving the uh, surviving the attack. There's a there's a couple other ones that are that are sort of interesting. That um, you know, if they don't um, get the job done, they sort of uh, uh, nobody sort of remembers them, and they sort of kind of fade from 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 memory uh, most of the time. But um, who I who I did want to talk about, and I, I wanted to actually briefly mention. Um, uh, a guy named Samuel Bick. Um, this was a guy who, um, in the uh, in 1974, he. Um uh, attempted to hijack a plane and, and he wanted to crash it into the into the White House and, and kill Richard Nixon. And what's what's interesting is that this was like five days after um, there was another incident where a um, uh, an army private um, like stole a. a uh, an army helicopter and like flew it to to Washington and landed it on the lawn at the White House. Um, and this had happened <laughs> like like five days prior to this guy Samuel Beck. He tried to hijack a plane uh, outside of Baltimore, and um, he was um, uh, shot uh, shot and killed by the uh, by the police there in the cockpit before the the plane ever ever took off. But I, I, I mention that, and it's interesting because there was a lot. Um, there was a lot of speculation. There was some sort of like thought, uh, like in, when people were thinking about like aviation safety after that, like um, people sort of that was when it first dawned on people, like man, a uh, a fully loaded fueled seven forty seven could sure do a lot of danger if somebody wanted to try to use it as a weapon. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ! And he's even this incident is even mentioned in the nine eleven um, the nine eleven report because it was sort of um, there was a lot written wow. after the, the the Samuel Bick incident about how something exactly like that could happen and how um how different the situation could have been if he'd um attempted the hijacking once the plane got in the air right his his fatal flaw was that it was still on the ground it never he never got it to take off the, the blocks were still behind the uh, in front of the wheels so the plane couldn't move but um so who i really wanted to uh, to focus on though i wanted to focus on an assassination attempt on the uh the other the other roosevelt um franklin franklin roosevelt was the uh, was the target of a, a assassination attempt um before he ever even um became president it was actually just three weeks before his inauguration and oh. um 
He was in uh, was in Miami where it happened. This was uh, February fifteenth, nineteen thirty three. He had been in um, he had been in Florida on like his winter vacation. He was visiting with um, Vincent Astor of the Astor family, and he was um, oh, yeah. like on a a twelve day cruise around um, Florida on his yacht, uh, the Norma Hal. Um, which interesting, I looked that I looked that yacht up. That yacht was then sold to the Coast Guard and was um, commissioned as a, a gunship during World War II. Uh, it was used by the Jesus Coast Guard and the Christ. Navy. Um, but um, so this is Vincent Astor, the, the son of uh, um, John Jacob Astor, who, who famously died in the in the Titanic. Um, and yep. So this was this was his mm-hmm. son, who we've covered before. <laughs> yes, and so this is uh, this is his son, who was uh, the president was uh, was visiting with down in um, down in Florida, and so they um, they'd been out on this yacht sailing around uh, sailing around Florida for for around twelve days, and um, so they arrive in in Miami on on, on February fifteenth. And the um, the plan was to have a um, you know kind of uh, a short parade from the um, you know from where they from where they docked to the um, you know of the president's motorcade to, to Bayfront Park in Miami where he was going to say a few words before um, boarding his train to, to New York. The whole thing was like a, a forty five minute uh, event. Um, it was not a very uh, long long thing that they had planned there. And I found um, a, a, among some of the, the things I found for this, I, the most detailed article I found that gave the most description was um it kind of gave the most details about uh about everything that went on was um it was from let me see if i can find it it was from the 1950s and it's funny because it's sort of written in this very sort of old-timey um style but it was some um some some publication from um from florida in the uh in the 1950s that, that gave this sort of very um very long detailed um account of, of everything that happened and um just to uh to touch briefly on the the motorcade and, and sort of who all was in it. Um, I wanted to read a little bit directly from the um, from that article because it's just sort of funny to me the way this um, the, some of the um, the, the uh, <laughs> some of the, the wording of this. Um, but reading from it here, it says an official party met Roosevelt and his friends at Pier Two, where the Norma Hal docked. In the trip to Bayfront Park, the entourage, the entourage was divided into two parts. The second being composed of lesser celebrities who did not rate inclusion in the first. In the first were three cars and an escort. The first car contained the Secret Service men. Then came Roosevelt and Mayor Gaultier of, uh, this was the mayor of Miami at the time. Uh, on the way to the park, Vincent Astor asked, uh, told Moley if anybody wanted to shoot the vice, the uh, president-elect, he could not ask for a better opportunity. Uh, in, what the, in the third car rode Raymond Moley and Vincent Astor. Um, a couple things here. I think, first of all, it's it's funny the way they describe the, um, like, the fucking, like, trash people in the in the second car who, who <laughs> weren't good enough to um shit tier yeah, celebrities <laughs> um but yeah also i mean obviously fucking in, in, investi- investigate vincent astor here um for for fucking for that comment but also i think it's funny that they they also um uh the, the way they say vincent astor told moley like they use this guy's last name before they give his full name <laughs> to like you know, kind of give you the the context of, of who they're talking about um moley by the way was um was raymond moley um kind of interesting uh, aside about him he was one of uh, roosevelt's campaign advisors in the 1932 election and he wrote a lot of the Early speeches of of Roosevelt's presidency, including his um, first inaugural address, which is um, you know probably one of his most famous. He's he's not credited with the that exact like only thing we have to fear is fear itself um, mm-hmm. phrase, but he he is credited with uh, with writing the the majority of that speech. Um, he also claimed credit for coming up with the term the New Deal, um, but that is that is disputed. But um, in sort of reflecting on the New Deal, uh, a sort of interesting uh, quote here from him, he said that capitalism was saved in eight days. Um, that was what he'd said about the president's first moves in, in 1933 after he'd been uh, after he'd been uh, inaugurated. Um, Where, where's the lie? Yeah. <laughs> where's the lie? Where's it's, the it's, lie? It's, it's so interesting to a- eight days that shook the world. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting to, to hear them, um, and especially to kind of to like look back at, at times like this and to to um, kind of hear so, sort of the way people would talk in their own words about class and about capitalism and in much more stark terms than anybody would dare sort of um, willingly kind of. Um, 
um, talk about today. And it's it's, it's interesting that um, it sort of illustrates just how much this was. Um, um, the, the New Deal was sort of this um, basically being kind of forced by the left to make some sort of concession or we're just fucking they're going to fucking rip us from our <laughs> rip us from our fucking mansions and, and uh, um, yes. we're going to have a revolution. Um, they were very afraid of the uh, uh, developing class consciousness at that time. And um, it's interesting that um, what is what is so widely remembered is this sort of um, you know social project that um, that, that uh, did, did a lot of good for folks and sort of the uh, closest closest thing we've ever had in this country to any sort of um, a kind of democratic socialism um, was sort of talked about very uh, frankly by the people who are actually involved as like look we got to do this like this is we're not doing this for them yep. we're doing this to fucking save capitalism it's we have to do it yeah I think I think they were acutely aware. Oh, yeah. Of mm-hmm. of you know the <clears throat> different parts of the cervical spine mm-hmm. that could be severed with uh, you know mm-hmm. sh- different uh, farm equipment. <laughs> <laughs> basically <laughs> interesting uh interesting another thing though is that um that that quote about uh saving capitalism in eight days that was from a book that uh, raymond moley had written in in 1939 called after seven years which was uh, actually an attack on the new deal by that time he had uh turned on the new deal uh, and roosevelt and liberalism and um of course, you know, yeah. became a conservative republican he went on to um re- there's some good ideas happening in europe <laughs> as we speak <laughs> <laughs> that are much better solutions to the problems with workers. <laughs> um, yeah, he he would go on to write for the uh, for the National Review, and um, okay, good. received the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom from Richard Nixon in uh, in 1970. <laughs> so illustrious, I fucking illustrious love it. career there. Um, so anyway, so um, back to uh, back to Miami there. So they they pull into the president's motorcade. They pull into um, Bayfront Park, and um, Roosevelt notices um, uh, Anton Cermak, who was the mayor of Chicago, who also just happened to be there. He wasn't um, there with the president. Um, he was there on vacation uh, in Miami, and he'd come to the event because he knew the president was going to be there, and he knew him personally, and he came to the event to um, I guess to, to say hi to him. So they talk for a, a little bit. Roosevelt gives his speech, which is like very short, like two minutes long. Um, you know, from the from the back seat of the the car they're in with the with the top down. And then after his uh, after his talk, he, he begins talking to um, uh, Mayor Cermak again, and that's when the um, uh, that's when the shots kind of ring out. Uh, five or five or six shots, I believe, total. Roosevelt is not hit. Um, Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, is hit in the lung. Um, five other people Jesus. are five other people in the crowd are, are injured. Um, none as seriously as Cermak. Um, several of the the other injuries are, are, are sort of superficial. Nobody else is really seriously wounded. But um, but uh, uh, Anton. Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, is uh, mortally wounded, and the um, the shooter is a guy named Giuseppe Zangara, um, who is an Italian immigrant. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> worked as a uh, um, worked as a brick leg, uh, bricklayer. He had um, come to the United States um, uh, a little less than, than ten years earlier in, in 1923, um, and he lived in, in New Jersey for most of that time. And he actually only had just moved to Miami six weeks before the before the shooting. And he. Um, he had been in the uh, the Italian army in, in World War One and um, and had served on the uh, the Austrian front and um, you know after his arrest he, he talked a lot about himself and about his his motivations. Um, he was very frank about everything. He told the police that he like he he had tried to. Um, um, this obviously can't be, be proven, but this is what he he told the police in, in Miami was that he in Italy he had tr- he wanted to assassinate the, the king of Italy, and he had attempted to do it in um, in Naples, but the, um, the 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 crowd was, I guess the crowd was was too big and it prevented him from um, from from getting within range. It was, um, I, not a lot of people talk about this, but the moon hit his eye. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> But yeah, so he, um, he he comes to the United States and he, he sort of, um, I mean, ultimately, sorry. ultimately he hated capitalism. I mean, he was um, described as a, described as an, an anarchist mostly from from the stuff I've seen. Although I haven't really um, um, heard him um, kind of really 
lay out any sort of full ideology that would um, sort of uh, uh, let somebody let somebody um, know that specifically that he was an anarchist. But he, he um, yeah, he was uh, uh, was on the leftist, uh, was on the left, was an anti-capitalist. Um, and when he came to the United States, he sort of transferred that that hatred because originally he'd he'd hated like the, his officers in the army, and then he hated the, the king of Italy. And then um, once he came to the United States, he um, he hated the president. He just hated capitalism which is very reasonable <laughs> honestly yes. um he hated rich and powerful people who who oppress working people um he had originally wanted to um to assassinate uh hoover uh who he blamed for for causing the the great depression he'd originally planned to kill him uh in fact he was going to he was already down in miami at that time when he he'd, he'd made the decision and he was going to uh, take a bus up to up to i guess dc to attempt to assassinate hoover when he read in the paper that roosevelt was going to be um roosevelt who uh, was the president elect was was going to be in in miami and so he decided to to kill him um he bought a gun uh at a pawn shop for eight dollars a couple days before the uh the assassination attempt and um another another thing that's uh that's worth noting about him um is that he often he, he also he suffered from this um chronic severe abdominal pain and he was never he mm. was pretty much like constantly in in pain in his stomach and he was never like within his lifetime very familiar uh, <laughs> yeah we call it agita. <laughs> yeah um but he was never able to get um proper treatment for it when he was alive he was never no doctor was able to um to figure out what caused it um one doctor had um you know told him that removing his appendix would um would help would lessen the pain so he, he got the surgery uh didn't help at all if anything it um made the made the pain worse um he he believed what he believed was that the um because he'd started suffering the abdominal pain from from a very young age from the age of six and he um he had said that um it was from doing um like hard manual labor from a ver- from a child on his on his father's farm that's that's what that's what he believed he'd grown up very um you know very poor at a, at a time in a part of the world with a lot of um mm-hmm. sort of uh, upheaval and um um you know, it was a very difficult sort of upbringing, and he, he had to um, work, you know, work very hard from a very young age. Is sort of where he kind of um, began building these, um, you know, this sort of uh, anti-capitalist sort of um, uh, ideology. Um, but that's what he blamed. Um, that's what he blamed also for his um, his chronic stomach pain. He thought it was like strained abdominal muscles or something. Um, his autopsy determined that uh, more than likely it was caused by a, uh, like a chronically diseased gallbladder. Um, it was probably Jesus. what the uh, what the what the cause of it. Actually was so so these are like sort of sort of and i'm mentioning this because these are sort of like his main um and in his own words these are like his sort of main driving uh, uh drives in, in his life is this sort of um this hatred of of the rich and this um uh, uh incurable stomach pain that is uh, that's it's with him all the time that he thinks is um you know believed is is, is worsened by capital and by um you know the, the hard sort of backbreaking work that he has to constantly do as a, as a bricklayer and stuff like that, and um, he he said that his um, his stomach pain got worse got worse when he thought about the injustices of capitalism. Relatable. And um, he um, some of the sources they they do say, and he sort of alludes to this because there is um, this video and audio of him of him talking. Um, he seems to have um, told police that he um, that by killing. Roosevelt, he could like eliminate his own pain by like passing that on to the fucking like the um the capitalist or whatever, and and, and giving them that pain. He he could, and I, who knows, he may have been speaking metaphorically or, or or whatever. But that's that's mentioned in a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the sources about this. Um, but he he come down to Miami, like I mentioned, just six weeks before the the shooting. He'd kind of been bouncing around, um, you know, hotels and, and rooming houses in in Miami Beach and in, in downtown Miami. But at the um. During the shooting, so he was uh, he was very he was five feet tall. He was he was uh, uh, quite a uh, quite a quite a short king, um, and so he wasn't he wasn't <laughs> he wasn't able to to see over the crowd to shoot right. So he um, he should have uh, asked his buddy. twin brother. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, he stood up Luigi. on a, he stood up on a chair. <laughs> And I guess this first kind of, um, you know, had made people notice him, um, you know, after the after the first shot, which I think was the one that, that hit Sir Mackey, um, you know, other people in the crowd sort of grabbed his arm and um, <clears throat> wrestled the gun from him. And, um, you know, within seconds, seconds the um, Secret Service had um, tackled him and uh, got him into the car and, and taken him to the uh, to the Dade County Jail. 
where he was interviewed by Dade County Sheriff Dan Hardy and uh, and gave a, a full confession. Um, and I'm going to play a, a video, a little bit of, of them talking a little bit later. Sort oh, of, please. sort of incredibly, there's there's video of, of him and this um, um, Florida sheriff. Um, but he was very. He didn't mince words. He gave a full confession. He said, "Yes, I intended to kill the president-elect, and I was." Disappointed to discover that I had missed. Um, there's a, a, a direct quote from him here. I have the gun in my hand. I kill kings and presidents first and next all capitalists. Um, wow. Mayor Cermak, who had been um, who had been wounded, he'd been shot through the lung. He was um, pulled into, uh, you know, he hadn't been riding with Roosevelt, but he was pulled into the, the president's car and uh, taken to the hospital with uh, like in the back seat with uh, with Roosevelt as he was uh, as he was bleeding out. And um, he was taken to the hospital. Um, he would linger for, for several weeks before he actually died. But so, so originally, um, and this, the, the trial and, and, and everything, and the, the arrest and the trial and the conviction and, and all of this of, of Sangara, it, it moved in, incredibly, <laughs> incredibly fast by, um, by sort of today's standards. Of course, um, yeah. But he was, he was yeah. initially charged with four counts of attempted murder um, and, and, and pleaded guilty to all of these. This was before Sir Mac had died. Um, he was sentenced to um, 80 years in prison for that. Um, and, and all of this happened within a week, right? He, from, from, from the shooting to his sentence was uh, six days. Um, wow. <laughs> you know, that's the speedy trial that we're all promised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 19 days after the shooting, though, so a couple weeks after this, um, Mayor Cermak, the mayor of Chicago, dies, dies in the hospital. Damn. And um, interestingly, he died. Um, obviously, the, the gunshot wound was a, a contributing factor. He obviously more than likely would not have died had that not happened, but it was actually not his direct cause of death. There was sort of um, medical malpractice that, that sort of happened as well, and he, what he ultimately died of was um, a gangrenous colitis. Um, the oh, sure, the yeah, gunshot buddy. wound had healed, and it was the uh, opinion of his, his personal physician that his, his cause of death was the uh, was the colitis that had developed as a, as a complication while he was in the hospital. He he basically died of of sepsis basically, and the, by, by by that time the, uh, the the gunshot wound was was healing, and he would have survived. He would have survived that um, if that if that other if the other complication hadn't happened. Uh, regardless, Sangara now is um, <clears throat> charged with uh, charged with murder. Um, again, just how incredibly quickly all of this moved. Cermak died at 6:57 a.m. on March 6th. Um, his autopsy was conducted at 8:30 a.m. The report was sent to the coroner at coroner at 1 p.m. The coroner's report was then sent to the grand jury, which indicted Zangara for murder before 5 p.m. that afternoon. Um, Jesus Christ! Even more, um, sort of. Uh, just how quickly the uh, the American justice system um, worked at that time. Uh, he was sentenced to death, and he was executed just 14 days later on March 20th. What the fuck? March 20th, um, 1933. And um, there's some there's some interesting. I've got a couple. Let me find it here from this from this article. There are some. Um, there's a transcript of um, some of his uh, some of his interactions with the with the judge and. Um, some quotes from him here. Oh, this is kind of funny. Yeah, I, I highlighted this as well because I wanted to, to mention this. So there's a um, <laughs> there was a uh, a New York Times article that was um, you know written after this after this happened. And here's a um, here's a, a, a just a, a snippet from that article, which is is really funny to me. This sort of um, way they uh, wrote about this back then. Uh, but it says the president elect, feeling the bullets were intended for him, straightened up, set his jaw, and sat unflinchingly with calm courage in the face of danger, which would be expected from one of his family. <laughs> Who fuck? What? Did what he tell you that? I mean, did, like, how do you know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, the manufactured consent. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope someone says that about me when I go. <laughs> there's another. There's another funny thing that's um like it's just complete fabrication. A uh, fabrication from the um. Um, from the coverage of this that happened, there was uh, this sort of urban urban myth, and it's actually uh, printed on Mayor Cermak's, uh tomb. Is supposedly like as they were driving to the hospital, he told Roosevelt, um, "I'm glad it was me and not you." <laughs> oh my god! And there's no like this. It was um, like yeah. that was um, f wholly fabricated by the Chicago Tribune in the the article where they said that. There's no source on that. Nobody's ever like. There's no nothing that indicates that that was ever actually said, <laughs> except that um, you know that one that one article from from Chicago. Um, and they actually put that line on the guy's fucking on the guy's fucking grave. 
Um, no yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, a couple uh, – here's a little bit of a transcript here. It's interesting. I wanted to, to read. This is uh, uh, just a bit of uh, um, uh, Zangara talking about his uh, his stomach pain with the, uh, with the judge. Um, you know, he's asking him, like, you know, about why did you um, – you know, how did you first decide that you wanted to, to kill the president? And uh, he says, when did it first come into your mind? He says, all the time my, my mind is on my stomach. And he says, when did it come first come to your mind? Because he's talking about the, the assassination. But, he, but uh, Zangara just um, is talking about his, his, his chronic stomach pain all the time. And he says, when I get in trouble in the stomach, when I come, my head looks like I'm gone. You see, I suffer all the time, and I suffer because my father sent me to work when I was a little boy. If I know suffer, I know have trouble, I know kill the president. If I nice, well, I no bother the president. It get in my mind, capitalists make trouble to the poor people. Um, the man makes a lot of good points. I'm not, uh, I'm not yeah, saying I, mean, I support yeah. everything that's happened, but, um, <laughs> you know, he, he does make a lot of good points there. Um, yeah. And he said it. Yeah, not me. He, exactly. Exactly. Um, he also, he also told once he was, once he was sentenced to die, he, um, uh, he told the judge, well, I know scared of the electric chair because I was thinking I was right to kill the president. It is capitalist for the crooked government, and you as a crook man because the crook man put me in the electric chair. You know, if, if I had to reflect mm-hmm. on, you know, the gastrointestinal discomfort that I've suffered <laughs> in my life, which sure. isn't, you know, isn't chronic or anything like that, but the amount that I've suffered as a direct result to kind of like capitalism and the, the, the chronic... Um, uh, you know, issues that come from that. It's quite a lot in fairness. And I don't have any like endemic stomach issues. Yeah. So I can see maybe where he was coming from. Well, I mean, I think, I think it it illustrates as well. Um, you know, and it's, it's, uh, not all that different nowadays, just how much, um, um, it's, it's sort of easy to, um, to, to channel this to, to channel this anger right because this this sort of um, you know stomach pain that he had um, to um, to to attempt to to get medical treatment for it to not be able to get any kind of kind of medical treatment for it to kind of be in a in a, in a country where he's uh, um, you know not not native to and um, um, obviously has um, you know difficulty perhaps communicating with um, with people and just how just how um, just um, brutally isolating and awful um, capitalism is, especially you know if you have some sort of uh, a medical issue or um, and you're just completely unable to uh, to get any kind of um, any kind of help for that. It's definitely um, you can't obviously can't help but uh, but but feel for the guy. Um, you know, obviously had a had a very uh, had a had a hard life. I, I just want to put out there that as, as somebody who also has like chronic deep stomach problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually I don't rest those at at the feet of capitalism. Those are entirely my own sins. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> metastasizing <laughs> against me. Mm-hmm. So just as a you know a, another voice. In this it's good to yes. know. Debate. It's good to know. <laughs> just to put but um so i wanted to um i guess that's about i guess that's about it um apparently he was uh um when they took him into the uh to the electric chair to uh to die he was uh, apparently he was he was disappointed that there were no cameras there um he said like where are the where there's no capitalists that's, here to take my picture where where are the cameras um and he's so he's punk. kind of funny honestly and i'm gonna show you the the, the clip of him um, he's, he's kind of funny. Uh, I can't, I can't just, I just can't help but, uh, but acknowledge it. And, um, here's a, here's a clip I wanted to, uh, I wanted to play here. Don't, and, um. Don't show me snow, please. <laughs> no, this is, um, it's interesting. There, there actually, there is a video of the, of the assassination attempt. It's, um, completely dark. This happened at like 10 o'clock at night in 1933. So there, there is video footage of it. Uh, it's completely, um, not worth watching. You might as well just look at a, a black screen because that's essentially, um, what it is. But there is this um, newsreel, um, you know, from from back at the time that um, has the has the footage of the shooting, and then has some of the um, the footage of of uh, of Zangara being um, like speaking with the uh, the, the uh, Dade County Sheriff uh, at the uh, at the jail. And I wanted to play a little bit of that, um, mostly just so we can hear uh, a bit of Zangara in his own words, but also um, because yeah. I wanted to. Uh, I, I really like this like old timey newsman voice on this on this um, video, and like the way he pronounces Miami is like so funny to me. It's a, a pronunciation that I've absolutely never heard ever. <laughs> Mayor Cermak, critically wounded, is carried to Mr. Roosevelt's car. Resting in the arms of the president-elect, he has rushed to a hospital. They've got him. The Secret Service man load him on the rear of the car and hustle him away to jail. (laughs) And now, 
Rogue, the heroine. The woman whose courage all the world applauds. She probably saved Mr. Roosevelt's life by deflecting the assassin's aim. Mrs. W.F. Cross of Miami. Miami. My first thought was to get it. I knew he was shooting at the president, so my first thought was to get the pistol up in the air so he wouldn't hurt any of the bystanders. Now here's the uh, here's the uh, Zagara and the sheriff. Why you killed Mr. Roosevelt? What for in your mind? I told before. I have all time. All time in the mine, I get a capitalist to kill me. I suffer from this thing in the stomach for the capitalist. So now for the capitalist, I know I have this sickness in my stomach. He make you work. He make me work. Joe, you get a chance tonight. You will shoot the president tonight. I can't shoot no more. If you give you a chance. I should give a chance, I should, yeah. <laughs> you hate you don't like him for president. Uh, that's all. As a man, he's all right. As a man is all right, but the president is all right. That's about it. No That's about shit. it. I, I, I just, I, I, That's wild that they fucking brought the I know, camera in. There I know. I know, right? Um, and then he's know. so casual. I mean, I, I don't mean to be funny, but like, like one of the things that haunts yeah. me, like my biggest fear is like knowing you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, you know, in those moments or, you know, days or whatever that knowing you're going to die or whatever. And like, he's casual as shit. He's like real he's cool funny. He's cracking, he's, like, he's, yeah. cracking, he's cracking jokes. He's cracking jokes. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, listen. Which is interesting. Yeah, uh, I, just, yeah. I couldn't help but um, but but want to share that. I was really blown away because I'd heard of this. I'd heard of this before, but I, I really kind of d- dug into it, and I, I found that um, I was really uh, kind of shocked that that, that that footage even exists um, of the shooting, but much less of uh, much less of um, uh, him actually being being interviewed by the by yeah, the sheriff yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, interesting, um, interesting stuff. Jesus Christ. Happy President's Happy Day. Happy President's Day. Does anybody say that? Is that a thing you say? I don't you know. Say? Is that a thing you say? Why do we, why do we I have don't think this? I've ever... Why do we have this? I, 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 when I go to Starbucks mm-hmm. uh-huh. and they say happy holidays to me, I say no. <laughs> you say happy President's Day. You, you write, write George Washington on my, on my cup right now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it's just so funny that, like, by the, probably from, like, two months from now or whatever, like, probably close to a million people will have died from COVID, and we will have gotten no federal holiday. Yeah, I mean, it. it's it's easily already well over that. I mean, the, 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 the to- it's way, right, like, way right, 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 exactly. And yet, you know, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, or whatever, I, I, I have not even cared to look up. Who this who this holiday is supposed to? Yeah, I think it's Washington's. It. It's Washington's birthday. Even worse. I think that, Even yeah, worse. I think that's the idea. Again, you know, the syphilitic alcoholics. I don't know if we talked about that <laughs> on air before, but you know, the slave owning, you know, gentry class or whatever of a guy that was one of the richest men in the colonies and shit. Like, I don't particularly see why this is something that I would like to celebrate, <laughs> aside from you know. Uh, you know, having some Galliano on a su- uh, on a Sunday well, evening. What's even uh, but that's like what's even sicker about normal. it is that like like most places don't do like most countries don't do this shit where we sort of like um uh, sort of like almost like make a religion out of the founding fathers and out of the founding of the country and like yes yeah, the the civic yeah, national and like to religion. to the point yeah, where yeah. like people really believe that like fucking um like the constitution was divinely inspired um and, and like really have sort right. of like made a made a religion <laughs> out of this um <laughs> yeah, you're going to say it's not prove it <laughs> I mean, I guess the Bible also is cool do it. with slavery, so it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. I remember talking to some uh, somebody that was probably boomer age or something like that, and she was telling me how I don't know if it was her daughter or niece or something like that went to this kind of like not model UN, but like a it was a model UN type thing that would deliberate and model after like the you know the the founding fathers deliberating the Declaration of Independence mm-hmm. and the you know the Articles of uh, confederation and uh the bill of rights and all that stuff and i remember her like talking to her and she got like filled up like she started almost crying like get a little tear to her eye talking about this and about how like you know it, she was like it, it gives me so much like uh excitement and, and and emotions like thinking about how these men you know wanted to do this and, and create the um uh you know the country for the betterment of you know civilization or whatever the fuck she said and like you know we've been getting our underground phd in this stuff for the you know the past three years almost three years now and like any slight sc- 
scratching of the surface paint with your thumbnail will tell you that nearly no act or any bit of behavior from any of these fucking psychos is of use for any accolade at all. And in fact, if you have any command of, you know, the origins of this country or the colonies or or anything like that, sheer contempt and revulsion is probably the only rational reaction to this sort of shit that we we traffic in and we hear all the time. It's like, it's, it's insane to me that there's people that think that this is like a, the origins of this country or the, 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 the expansionary era of this country or the maintenance or the now that we're in like the, the imperial decline of this country is of any accolade. It's abhorrent at best, disgusting at best. And, and I've said this many times before, the, the, the ledger of like reparations that is owed from these like imperial advancements is bankrupt completely unquenchable there is not enough asset there's not enough like moral assets to offset the moral liabilities that has been incurred from the american project simply bankrupt absolutely disgusting that's also how my bathroom I'm literally blacking out. I'm blacking out. I can't do it. I can't. Happy President's Day, folks. See you next time. From your family to ours. Oh, God. Somebody give me a lead plate I could even off of, please. God, we went long. All right, we we gotta gotta go. We gotta go. (laughs) We gotta go. Happy President's on the march. (laughs) So long. Stay cool, everybody. Stay cool. Stay cool. Stay cool.